Valentine's That'll Day. That'll happen for so. sure. <laughs> So good morning, everybody, all of those that are online with me and all of those that are here in the class. Um, dun, dun, dun. I'm trying to see if anybody's got their cameras on, but nobody does. Okay, um, so I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. I did go ahead and watch the playback from the last class, and I did not like what was going on, okay? So one thing is it just seemed too busy, and then at some point it's not busy enough if you were to try to go back and watch that video. And so I didn't like the flow of how it worked, okay? Um, the second thing is, is I noticed since I'm not able, I was monitoring the people in the face-to-face uh, -face course and I had the people online working in like a group on mute, right? Um, but I couldn't manage them because they were on mute, right? And so it turned out that I only had like out of the seven people that were in Zoom, I had two people participating on one example, and then I only had three people participating on the second example that the Zoom people were doing. And I don't want that to be happening because I want everyone to be kind of chiming in, right? Um, I don't want to leave anybody out as far as speaking up for themselves and what they understand and what they don't understand and asking questions and all that good stuff. So we I already mentioned to you guys the previous Monday, right? When I first met you that this is new. <laughs> This three in one kind of class is completely new. And so I have to figure out what works for us. Okay. And I tried that and it just did not flow the way I really wanted it to flow. And I imagined in my mind, like maybe it'll be better the next time, but I really think that I just need to change it. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do instead is I am going to keep my camera on my paper. Um, we are still going to be working actually individually now instead of as a group. Okay, so what I'll do is with each problem that I kind of have identified is um, I'll give you some time to try it, try it out, see where you got stuck. You can tell me verbally where you got stuck or you can ask for help and I can help you. Um, but then we're going to come together and we're going to do the problem as a class. Okay, and then there you can also voice in any concerns that you had or any places where you got stuck. Um, and then we'll go on to the next problem and just keep working like that, okay? At the end of each section, I will ask if there were any other questions from that section. So if you had taken a look at the homework assignment for 5.2 and you were stuck on one or two of them, and if we address them, fantastic. If we hadn't addressed it, then please, please do bring it up, okay? Um, and then we'll move on to the section 5.3 and then eventually 5.4. Okay, so hopefully that helps it <laughs> flow a little bit better and it kind of helps me keep control of what everyone is doing and not just those of you in the face to face class. I can also kind of figure out what's going on with people in zoom. Okay, um, is everybody okay with that, especially those that are in zoom. You can either give me a thumbs up yay i'm good with that or <laughs> I have concerns, whatever it is. Okay, so far I got two thumbs up. I don't know. Nope, now we got some more. Um, okay, so we're gonna see how this goes. Hopefully when I do the playback, everything makes a lot more sense. Um, and we'll just go from there. So this is the first example. I know there's a bit of a, um, I don't know how to shadow it, <laughs> but I'm not gonna use pencils anymore because it looks like the light is reflecting, especially like in this area. And so it's a little bit lighter than I wanted it to be, but it does say find a formula for the sum of n terms and use the formula to find the limit as n goes to infinity. So do me a favor and on your piece of paper, and I, I can't see what the people in Zoom are doing, okay? I can see what you guys are doing. Please do not just sit down <laughs> and wait for us to go over it, okay, if you're in Zoom because I can't monitor you in Zoom. Please actually put your pen to your paper and try it, okay? Um, it's really important that you actually try to get hands-on and get going with it, okay? Versus just waiting for us to tell you how to do it. Make your mistakes. Now is the time to make them, then you can fix them, okay? So that you don't do that again in the future. Um, okay, so I'll let you write this one down. As soon as I let you guys write that one down, I'm gonna go flip over to the formulas page 
just so that you can see the formulas if you don't have them in front of you, okay? And you don't have to write all the words, you just write the actual limit. <laughs> And I do have a nervous laugh and I realize I do it a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Every time I'm nervous, I giggle. And then I was watching the replay and I was like, oh my God, how annoying. I giggle all the time. <laughs> yeah, most people do have some... Some people bite their nails or whatnot, but finds a giggle. And I have like a, a, a high pitched loud giggle, so I just don't like it. <laughs> it's my mom's giggle and I never liked her doing it either. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put the formulas up. There we go. If you don't know where to start, my highest recommendation is to distribute that seven over N. I have something, but I don't know if it's right. What'd you get? I have 23.3. 23.3. Is it? Yeah. Uh, it's 24.5, actually. Uh, okay. Oh, you're right. But that sounds close. Don't do this again, man. Bye bye. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break it down. So I'm going to go back to my camera here. And so I mentioned the first thing to do is to distribute that seven over n, right? So anyone and everyone, if it's possible, can come off of mute or say it out loud in class. Um, what we would get when we distribute that seven over um, n. So when I take seven over n times this guy and seven over n times that guy, what two terms do we get? Mm -hmm. we can treat that three right like a whole like a fraction like that right and so then we're doing top times top bottom times bottom so you're right we get 21 over n now for the second term what do we get yes yeah, seven i over n squared perfect and then what i suggested the students in class did i know i can't see what you guys are doing in zoom but I suggested that they split that summation. So we split this into two separate summations. So nothing is changing. I'm just basically writing the sigma, the indexes, right? Um, twice for each one. Okay, then here's where it got a little weird because if we notice on our formula sheets, all the formula sheets either have a constant right? Or they have I, I squared, I cubed, so on and so forth. But none of those formulas have ends in them, do they? None of them, okay? And so what I did is I factored out what I could so that it could match those formulas, okay? And for here, you have actually a choice. Some people may have factored out just one over eight. whereas I was actually telling folks that this is actually multiplied by an invisible one. If I multiply this fraction by an invisible one, isn't it the same fraction, right? So there's always like these little invisible ones hanging out in the background, okay? We just can't see them. And then this one is actually can be written out as seven over n squared times i. So I by rewriting these uh, sigmas, I can write it in but I'm going to factor out of the sigma these, these values that don't have i's in them. So then I would have 21 over n 
my sigma, and then that one is finally visible. Then over here, I would factor out the seven over n squared, and I would have just that i left over. Now, this matches the formula number one, and this one matches formula number two on that sheet, okay? So I'm actually finally gonna get to apply my formula. And so then we get 21 over n times whatever the constant is, the summation is gonna be that constant times n, right? Then over here, for the i, that one was a little bit longer. It was the n, n plus one over two. Is that right? Okay. So, so far we simplified what was in what I was summating. And then I kind of tried to play with it and manipulate it a little bit so that it looked nice and pretty for me to apply those formulas, okay? Some people don't do these two steps. They do them in their head. And then just say, I'm gonna have 21 in times in, and I'm gonna have seven over n squared times n, n plus one. If you're skipping these two steps, that's totally okay, as long as you're doing it correctly, right? When you're not doing it correctly, then that's when you need to actually like follow the flow and write every single thing down, okay? But there are times where we can do stuff in our head. So from here, all I have to do is algebraically simplify this mess, and then I can eventually take my limit, right? Is everybody good so far? Anybody have any questions? No, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So then continuing with this, we're gonna actually multiply these things together. And so then here, if I'm multiplying this, it's like I get 21 in over in. Imagine again, this is like a fraction, right? Top times top, bottom times bottom. Again, if you're at simplifying this stuff on your own, in your head, that's totally okay. If I multiply here top times top, and bottom times bottom, this is what I get. And now I'm gonna to try to reduce this before I actually try to continue. That's just me, I try to make it as simple as I can before I have to put things together, okay? So I actually noticed that I have an in here and an in here, which can reduce. And I have an in here, and I have two of them, right? An in squared but I can cancel one of them with one of them. So I'll just have one of the ends left at the bottom. So I have 21 plus um, seven parentheses n plus one over two n. Now algebra is really funny because as long as you're not breaking any rules, you could do whatever steps you want in whatever order you want, okay? So your simplifying steps may have different from mine and that's perfectly okay. As long as you're not making up stuff <laughs> and you're actually following how fractions work and how reducing works, then you should be good. Okay, so from what I'm gonna do next is I actually wanna split this fraction because I see that there's two terms in the numerator, right? So the first thing I wanna do is actually distribute that seven and then I wanna split the fraction into two separate fractions, okay? So if I distribute this seven, I'm gonna have seven in plus seven in the numerator and still the two in downstairs. And then finally, I'm gonna separate those fractions. So I have seven in over two in plus seven over two in. And then the last thing is I notice I can simplify that middle fraction because these ends will reduce. So I'll have 21 plus seven over two plus seven over two in. Now I could take my limit here. And if I do, I don't write limit. Actually, I am gonna write limit because I'm gonna write every single step. <laughs> Even though I know a lot of you are gonna do this part in your head and you might not write this step down. But I actually split the problem into each term. You by no means have to write this step ever. I just want people to know where things came from if they look back at this paper, okay? So I'm gonna move this up a little bit. 
So we have the rules that we actually need to come into play here. And I wrote them on the board, but you guys in Zoom cannot see that. So I'm gonna write them here on the side, but we have the limit of a constant is just gonna be that same constant, okay? We also have the limit as n goes to infinity of a fraction, and that limit is actually zero, okay? So for these two, I'm actually applying that top rule. So this limit is just gonna be 21, and this limit is just gonna be the constant seven over two. This one though, I'm gonna have to split it again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna rewrite this as seven over two times one over, and that is equivalent to this fraction, right? If I were to do top times top and bottom times bottom, they are equivalent, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split that up and I'm gonna put the constant on the outside of the limit. And then all I'm gonna have left over is one over n on the inside of the limit, okay? And then we know, according to this rule right here, that that's just going to be seven over two times a big zero, which means this whole term is just going to be a big zero, isn't it? And so really my answer is just these two things, which if I type them in the calculator or I double this with the common denominator, I'm going to get 49 over two, which is that 24.5, okay? Anybody have any questions with that? Now, some people do go from here to here and they just have zero, okay? I'll explain that without having to write these steps. We know that the limit of a constant is just that constant. So a limit of this constant is just that constant, right? And if you have an n downstairs, as your downstairs goes to infinity, the bottom of the fraction is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but that means the value of the whole fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Closer and closer and closer to zero. So then the limit of this with the n downstairs is just one big fat zero. And then in the end, you have to just add those together later anyway, okay? But you don't have to write these steps. You can do them in your head if, I guess, quote unquote, you're that good, right? <laughs> Most of us at the beginning will have to write every single thing so that we can see where everything is coming from, right? Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm very meticulous <laughs> when I write down my step. And I really try to make my lines look like the formulas before I apply those formulas so that I know that this is exactly equivalent to this, okay? Good, good, good. That's the probably the headache of the class today. <laughs> we took about 45 minutes or so to go through it, but that's okay. Um, I always told you guys, we don't rush in this class. So the point is that you see everything and that you understand it all, okay? That's what's important, not time. Believe it or not, I always factor in a few extra days in my timeline. It might look like there's something on every day, but a lot of those sections can be covered together. I just put them separate to buy me more time, okay? So that was the end, the last, last example, because we did like three examples, right, on, on Monday from 5.2. This one was a pretty extensive one. I think it's the hardest one out of the whole homework section. So if anybody has looked at the 5.2 homework section, is there any other problem that seemed pretty difficult that I don't have a video for and that we did not cover in class. If you already took notes and you jotted down some, let me know. Okay, it's quiet. So <laughs> I'm going to go on to 5.3. You definitely want to come to class with those questions already. Okay. Um, so like, for instance, if we, if, if we get to 5.4 today, then when we come together again, actually we don't see each other on Monday, right? Because it's Labor Day holiday, mm -hmm. okay? So when I see you guys again on Wednesday, make sure that you've at least seen the 5.5 assignment and so that you know which ones that you're struggling with, okay? We got a slow start, which is actually a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? <laughs> it's a good thing. Like 
So for 5.3, this one was pretty basic. The main idea is, is being able to translate back and forth between a graph and an integral, okay? So if I give you a graph, you wanna be able to write the area of that shaded region as an integral, or if I give you an integral, you want to be able to show me what the graph looks like and where that shaded region is, okay? So the graphing part is going to be the more challenging part, I think, because we don't have those graphing calculators, right? So we really have to remember all of our graphing techniques and all of that stuff from college algebra. Now, it doesn't get too crazy. We might have like squares, like a quadratic, which is not too hard to graph. These absolute value things, which again, are not too hard to graph. Um, constants, linear equations, and that's pretty much all I try to give you at the beginning, okay? Um, of course, things can get more complex. You have some basic trig uh, graphs, but I try to show you all the steps on how I'm obtaining these graphs. So that way it's a refresher at the same time, okay? Um, so for 5.3, the first example I have is says to write a definite integral that yields the area of the region it does not want me to evaluate. I know that if you already looked at 5.4, you know how to evaluate it and actually find the numerical value for the area, but don't do it, okay? <laughs> We're just setting up the integral. So essentially what I want is I wanna know what your lower bound should be, your upper bound should be. I wanna know what's the one that goes in here. And then because everything's in terms of X, it would be DX. So that's essentially what we're looking for. Now, I did have somebody in one of the discussions ask me about if it had a dy. If it has a dy and it doesn't do them to all of them, because not all functions can be translated into terms of y, um, and it'd still be a function. But if it were in terms of y, you wouldn't actually be looking at the leftmost and the rightmost bounds of x. You would be looking at the low bound and the high bound for y. Okay. We don't have any of those yet today. However, I promise when we get to chapter seven, we're going to see it a whole lot more. Okay. And I have to take things really slow with that chapter because you really have to visualize it in order to figure out what to do. Okay. But for now, try to do example one. And if you finish a little bit early, try to do example two. I'm going to go ahead and pause you again because we're just going to be silent. Okay. So work on both of those and let's see what you get. And so then I wrote this here, trying not to give too much away. But in reality, in the textbook, it tells you that the area is going to be from A to B. And does anybody remember what goes inside of the integral? No crickets. <laughs> is the function, whatever that function might be. OK? And remember, A is your lower bound, right? And little b is your upper bound. But that means when you're looking at a graph with respect to x, that means the leftmost x value and then the rightmost x value, OK? So my shaded region is bounded by these two x values, right? So then that means that my lower bound is going to be that left value. And then my upper bound is going to be that right x value. And then my function is this function here. But because I'm trying to integrate two terms, right, you tell the reader that you're actually integrating both of these, OK? So then you have to use some kind of grouping mechanism, whether it be a bracket or a parentheses, but something around those so that you tell the reader you're integrating that whole thing, OK? Saying this is incomplete and saying this, or actually not even that, is incomplete, right? Both separate or incomplete, okay? So you have to make sure that's in parentheses so that I know you're taking the integral of both of those. It's just a notation thing. So it is very much straightforward. These are not that complicated. These problems should literally take five seconds to do all of them in this whole section, okay? The only ones that might not is the ones you have to actually grab because those take a little bit to grab, right? In the computer, it's nice and easy because in computer, it gives you all these choices, right? <laughs> and so you just look at it and you find the one that matches the function and then uh, select the correct answer. But for us, we have to actually physically draw it, okay? 
So try the next one. And again, don't evaluate this integral. You're writing what it should be and that's it. So try this one. Um, more of you were able to do the second example pretty easily. So I actually wanna hear from the people in Zoom. Anybody tell me what the lower bound of this integral should be? Zero. 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 Good, good. Yes. All y'all answering, I love it. <laughs> what about the upper bound? Um, pi over two. Pi over two. Yes, my leftmost X value, my rightmost X value of the shaded region, right? Good. And then what is my function here? Time. Sin X. I heard something weird. Maybe it was parenthesis um, sine x um, that, dx. Yes, that's good. So you you chose to put the parentheses in here, which is not wrong. However, needed. Not when it's just one term you're integrating. Okay. When there's two terms you have to integrate, you must put those parentheses. When it's one term to integrate, you don't need the parentheses. Okay. So right. Good. Good, good, good. Okay, so the next two, this one may, you may, not that everyone remembers, but you may remember <laughs> how to graph that because that's my function, right? But I'm not sure that everyone remembers how to graph this. However, I did pick that as an example for a reason so you could kind of model after it, okay? Um, but I'll let you guys take some time to try to graph these and then shade the region that's supposed to be shaded. Okay, so graph the function first. Remember, my function is what's inside that integral. And then once you have that graph, try to shade the right region, okay? I don't wanna say right, the correct region. <laughs> and I'll pause to give you guys some time. Okay, I did have a student ask a question about the previous problem. Um, and so in essence, the question was sort of like, could you do this problem like we did the previous problem? Or could I have done this problem in this way, right? Um, and the answer to both those questions is no, because here I am not given individual facts about the bounds from zero to five or the variable T, right? Here, the facts were given to me for the variable x, and they were given to me for the bounds of two to eight. So I couldn't apply those um, ideas to this example here, okay? And then the reason why the answer is no for the other question is because if these are the directions, and they're saying to, in, to evaluate the integral using facts, then you must follow those directions and use those facts, okay? Doing it this way, I never used those facts and therefore I wasn't following the directions of the problem, okay? Um, and it is worth mentioning because I do believe there is a problem like this on the test um, and there's also problems like these on the test. And so you have to know for these, you must use the facts. Don't just do antiderivative and plug in the values, okay? But for this problem that didn't give us facts, we have to find the antiderivative, okay? And then plug in the bounds. So for 5.4 example one, um, what was the first step? What did you do first? Foil. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody in the class said foil, yeah, or distribute, same thing, but we have to actually square quantity. Now in the future, in a future section, we will learn to integrate this without having to square it. Because what if that power was a seven? I don't wanna sit here and multiply seven of them, right? So there is a short way to do that. It requires what's called substitution method. Um, and essentially that's what we're gonna be doing um, a lot in this class. So I know we did it a lot back in, um, no, because Cal 1 was the one for, I'm thinking this is Cal 3, is not Cal 3. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just what we're doing in Cal 2 is basically learning how to integrate any kind of weird thing that you can see, okay? I mean, uh, 
horrible things. You're going to see them. <laughs> but they're not, they're, they're crazy. And they get crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier until we get it to the end. Okay. So fun, right? <laughs> it is actually fun. I always think of math as a puzzle. So we don't know how to do this yet. So we're going to actually have to expand it out. So what I did is I just like to write it twice. Some people do this on the side. I just like to do it in the problem itself. Um, and so then I'm gonna put a big parentheses because I know I'm gonna get a bunch of terms right after I FOIL this out. So I'm gonna have four T squared minus six T minus six T plus, okay. And then if I combine those two like T terms, I will get minus 12 T and then the plus sign. And then now that I have individual terms, again, you can write this step or you can opt to not write this step. But essentially what I'm doing in my head is I am integrating every term individually, okay? And you could take out the, the coefficients too if you wanted to. Um, I don't, I just leave them as multipliers after I do my antiderivative. So this four is like a multiplier. And then what's the antiderivative of t squared? Mm -hmm. t yeah, t to the third over three. Now I'm gonna move on to the next one. And we do not put plus c when there's bounds, okay, ever. Don't ever put plus c when they're bounds. If you did, when you plug in one bound, the c is gonna hang out. When you plug in the other bound, the c is gonna still be there. And then when you subtract the Cs, they're gonna go away anyway, right? So that's why they're not necessary. So then now what's the antiderivative of T? T squared over T. Mm -hmm. And then what's the antiderivative of just the constant? Nice. It's just the T in there, right? Good. And then I'm gonna tell myself, oh, but you still have to evaluate this thing from zero. Why did I put five? I mean, it was five. I just put nine out of nowhere. <laughs> I did that in one of the videos too. And somebody caught it. Three people caught it, but only the first person that mentioned it, I gave them a bonus point on the test. So if you don't, know, when you're the first one, you'll get that bonus point. And there are errors. <laughs> I am no way perfect. So it happens. I mean, you saw right now, it just happened. And at least now I'm being monitored, right? <laughs> when I was making those videos, I was not monitored. I was just going and going. Okay, so let's go ahead and simplify this. I don't really think that I can make this any nicer, that first term. But the second term, it is just going to be. Mm -hmm. So that one, I just like to make it look as nice and neat as possible before I go plug in my bounds. I also will show you this step the first time. And then after that, I do not do it. So I'm going to plug in five, five, and five. And this is the part that I usually don't do. If I'm plugging in zero, 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 what's going to happen over here? They're all, zero. They're all going to be one big fat zero, right? So normally that's all I write, <laughs> okay? But because somebody needs to go back and look at this later, um, I'm going to write it out, okay? But in the future, it's gonna save us time and energy with not having to write all this out, okay? So I get four thirds times 125 minus six times 25. And that one I can do is just 45. All of these are big zero. So eventually I'm gonna subtract the big fat zero, right? Now, okay, good. I don't know what that is. 500, right? Mm -hmm. Oh God, if I have six quarters, I have 150 cents, right? <laughs> that is how I do it. Okay, now this part, because of that ugly guy right there, I am putting it in the calculator. Yeah, I do. One, okay, see, that's what I got. And I wasn't even trusting myself. 
I had that on my other little scribble over here. See, look, this is how I do them when nobody's watching me. <laughs> so I can do it real fast and real short, but it's messy. And then this is like teacher mode, right? So there's student mode and then teacher mode. You don't want to see my student mode notes, I promise. <laughs> okay, and I said I wasn't going to use a pencil and then I did. <laughs> but I think this one's not reflecting so bad like the other problem. Does anybody have any questions about this example one? Does it matter if the fractions are decimal? Um, if the computer says to round your answer, then you can totally give it a decimal, okay? But if the computer never asks you to round anything, then you cannot just chop a decimal off, okay? Because Or you chop a number off. And that's essentially what you're doing when you're rounding, right? Is you're just chopping off part of the answer. So don't, it will need a fraction if it doesn't ask for a decimal rounded to so many places. Okay. It wants the quote unquote exact answer versus the approximated answer. Okay. So always assume it wants the exact answer unless it literally tells you to round. Okay. But that's a very good question because that does come up a lot. Okay, I don't think I paused long enough, but does anybody have any questions over this one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, okay. Let's try example. And if you finish, you could try example three. Okay, for this one, did anybody get any or want to share what they got for example two? I got negative two. Okay. I got negative two as well. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Well, negative two is the correct answer, but let's work it out. This one is the issue, right? I can apply the rule to that one because there's a little invisible one. And so that allows me to apply the power rule. But for this one, I can't apply the power rule until it's written as a power, right? And if we remember our exponent rules, I know it's been a while, but there is a rule that says if you have an expression like that, that you can write it as a negative exponent, okay? So essentially the second term becomes u, but with a negative two exponent. And then regardless of whether you write the next step or you don't, okay? because my next step is to split the integral and do the integral of each one, or if you just went straight into the antiderivative of each one, okay? It, it doesn't matter. But for my purposes, I am going to um, split it up. So I have u to the one power du minus, and then u to the negative two power du. And so then I'll integrate each one. Again, you don't have to write this step, but if you need to, go for it. Now I'm gonna apply my power rule. So my power rule says I'm gonna add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Same thing here. I'm gonna add one to my exponent and divide by that new exponent. But I still have to evaluate it from negative two to negative one. So this becomes u squared over two, like we're used to seeing it, right? And then what does the other one become? Mm -hmm. And what's negative plus one? So then this becomes u to the negative one over negative one. Now I'm going to fix this because I don't like negative exponents personally. Okay. So I'm going to keep this the squared over two, but then these signs I'm going to multiply together to give me a positive. And I'm going to write that negative one power back in its fraction form. Now, from there, we're going to plug in one number, the top bound, right? And then I'm going to plug in the bottom bound. No. Nope. 
And again, here you can figure it out on your own or you can use a calculator. I do it a little bit on my own. Like I know that's positive one. Um, this all together is just gonna make a minus one. Here that's gonna be positive four divided by two. And then here that's gonna be stuck as a minus one half. And so this is what I'm doing in my head, but again, you can use a calculator here. But essentially what I do is I distribute this so it becomes a minus two and a plus one half. Um, so one half plus one half is one, but then I'm taking away one, aren't I? So basically everything's gonna go away besides the minus two, okay? But if you can't do that, that's totally okay. I just, like I said, I've been working with numbers for 20 years, right? Over 20 years, shoot. Um, <laughs> so I can do a lot of steps in my brain. I try not to do it because it's important that you guys see what's happening, okay? Um, but if I ever do too much in my head, just let me know, okay? And I can break it down so that it makes sense. But yes, you're right, it is negative two. Okay, the other one is a little bit challenging and I do not think that five minutes is gonna be enough class time to go over that one, okay? Um, just because I wanna give you guys some time to try it and then we can talk about it together. So I'm actually gonna stop right here and we didn't finish 5.4. So if I have to shift, I'm gonna shift the assignment, okay? So I know it was one of the ones that I had that were gonna be due this Friday, but I'm not going to make it due this Friday because we didn't get to finish discussing it, okay? So if you're copying this down, I'll bring it back up. I'm gonna minimize my screen real quick just to show you something. If you go into Canvas, and again, make sure you're looking at this on a computer or a desktop or laptop, not a tablet or an iPhone, you don't get the same view. And so you don't see all of these little labels that I have here. But um, we only covered half of 5.4. So I'll edit this. I'll put in the class recording. I'll put in a copy of the notes that I have here. Um, and so just like I did with Monday's class, I'll put that same information right in here. And then Friday night, this one's going to actually be moved down to week three at some point. Okay. Um, stick it right there for right now. Um, but only these three are going to be due. I did push 5.1 because I noticed there were some people that just needed like one more point. And then also WebAssign was having some issues yesterday. So I know not everybody got to do what they wanted to do yesterday. Um, so I'm, I definitely pushed down the 5.1 as well. So I did them all, and I do have a bunch of people that finished. 5.1 perfect. You don't have to worry about 5.1 anymore, but anybody else that wants to go improve that score, you do still have some time to do so, okay? Is there any other questions? No? Okay, well then you guys have a good day. I will see you next Wednesday, not Monday. Monday's a holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye, have a good one. Okay, I noticed when we were in class that this, um, I did not actually come off of pause for the recording when we were discussing these two problems here. Um, so I wanted to come back and kind of discuss them uh, shortly so that way you had uh, this explanation. So for these two problems, we did graph uh, the function f of x equal to two. And when you have something like y equal to two, it is just a horizontal line at that y value. So I marked off two in the y value and drew that horizontal line. And then because the bounds were from zero to three, those were sort of our boundaries for the x values. And so I drew vertical lines within this section. And then we just shaded everything in between, okay? For the second graph, what we did was I plugged in the um, lower bound for X, I plugged in the upper bound for X, and then I plugged in another X value in the middle of those two values, which happened to be zero. And so then I plugged in negative three in here, the absolute value of negative three was positive three. So three take away positive three is just zero. Then when I plugged in this positive three for X, the absolute value of positive three is also positive three. So I have three take away another positive three, which results in another zero, okay? Then when I plugged in zero as X value, the absolute value of zero is zero, and three take away zero is still just three. And so that was the Y value here. 
Then I plotted each of those points, negative three, zero, positive three, zero, and then zero comma three. And then since I'm bounded by this graph and these X values, and of course the X axis itself, this is the shaded region that we are referring to, okay? So I definitely wanted to make sure that we had that as an example. Um, I am not sure if I came off of mute for this top example, so I'm going to cover it. And if I did, I'll just chop this part at the end off. <laughs> but if I didn't cover it, then it's going to stay. So for here, we had these three uh, pieces of information, and we were asked to evaluate this integral using these pieces of information. So to do it using the fundamental theorem of calculus by taking the antiderivative and then plugging in the bounds, that would not be following the directions here. So although you can get to the same answer by doing it with the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's not how the problem asked you to solve it, okay? And so you will see these things on the test, and especially you'll see one like this, and then you'll see one like this, and you need to know that you have to follow those directions, okay? So here, I cannot do the antiderivative. So essentially, all we did was split up the integral, and then I noticed that this actually looks like one of the facts, and it tells me that that statement is actually equivalent to zero to 30, I'm sorry. So then instead of writing this whole expression, I just wrote 30. Over here, though, I could factor out the 12 because it's just a multiplier. Um, and then when I'm left with this, I notice that that matched one of the other facts. And it turns out that that integral is equivalent to just six. So since this is 12 times this integral, it would be 12 times that value six. And then we followed our orders of operations and did um, the multiplication first and then did the subtraction and we ended up with that negative 42. Whereas over here, we took the antiderivative of X, we took the antiderivative of 12, and then we plugged in eight, we plugged in two, and I went ahead and entered all of that in my calculator because it didn't have any more space and it yielded the value negative 42 as well. Okay. Um, I did come off of record when we started with this one, so I won't go over that one again. But I just wanted to make sure that you had this in the video because I know it skipped over it. Okay. But other than that, that was a great class. Thank you guys. And I will see you on Wednesday.